Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started today. Uh, welcome to our Scilab seminar. Uh, I've been asked to uh, remind you that when you have questions during the Q&A, um, please use the microphones in front of you. Um, and the, these, uh, if you haven't been in here recently, there are new microphones that you have to uh, hold down while you talk. And you'll see the green lights uh, flashing when they are in use. Um, okay, so I am really uh, excited about today's speaker. Um, Nick uh, is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at Stony Brook University, and he's direct director of the PragSec Lab, um, where his students conduct research in all aspects of pragmatic security and privacy, including web tracking, mobile security, DNS abuse, social engineering, and cybercrime. Uh, and his work um, is really interesting um, and appears frequently in the popular press. Um, I've uh, been, been looking at a number of the papers on his website, and besides what he's going to talk about today, there's a lot of other um, really interesting recent work, including a large-scale study of tracker blocking tools um, and a paper that studied profile name reuse on Twitter. So you may want to check those out as well. Uh, he also recently won a Distinguished Paper Award at NDSS 2017. Um, I met Nick um, a few months ago when he gave a talk at the FTC, where I was at the time, and um, was really fascinated by the project and by this work, um, and thought uh, that there would be a lot of interest here in hearing about it. So with that, we'll, we'll let, let uh, Nick tell us all about it. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you all for being here. Can you, can you all hear me? Is it is good? OK. So the title of my talk is Dial 1 for Scam, uh, a large-scale analysis of technical support scams, which is the same title of our paper in NDSS. Um, but I'm going to give you sort of all the background that we couldn't cover in NDSS in, this, you know, in the 20 minutes allotted to each speaker. So, so Lori told you who I am, right? I work on various sort of pragmatic security and privacy areas. Sort of anything practical that you can imagine, I, I try to be in it, right? Uh, so, so since I'm going to talk a lot today about technical support scams, uh, we might as well agree on the definition of what a technical support scam is, right? And so in a technical support scam, scammers interact with victims over the phone, trying to convince them that their computers are infected with malware and are in need of their paid services, right? Um, and so maybe at this point, I would like to ask you, has anyone ever encountered such a technical support scam? Right? Exactly, right? <laughs> this, is, this is a very big problem right now, and I will explain why it is big. Uh, so there are really two ways to get to talk to people on the phone, right? And the first one is actually calling the user, right? And uh, this is called cold calling, where you suddenly receive a call from someone that says, hi, I'm calling from Microsoft or Symantec or from wherever else. Your computer has a problem. You need to give me access in order to remotely diagnose this, right? And this has been happening for the last, right, five or six years at least. The new uh, sort of generation of technical support scams actually flips this, and it gets the user to call the scammer. Right, uh, and it does so through scam pages. I want, we will understand today what these are. So, I would like you to sort of keep this in the back of your minds throughout the talk. That just because you think that this scam is obvious and no one should fall for this, that's actually not the case. Right? Um, there is um, this Ars Technica article um, actually sort of said that uh, technical support scams cost 120 million dollars uh, in the U.S. Right, uh, to people just, you know, who get unnecessary sort of uh, services for malware infections that are not there. Um, Microsoft and other big companies clearly don't like this because uh, it's, you know, these companies are acting out in their name. They are saying that we are Microsoft employees doing technical support. Uh, and they are trying to sort of to find these companies and hit them with lawsuits whenever possible. And there is definitely uh, hybrids of these attacks where, uh, you can combine a technical support scam with something else. For example, in this case, a scammer would actually install a crypto locker once you, know, you allowed them access to your machine. So even though you didn't have a problem before, you have a problem now. Right? Um, and if you sort of, exactly, uh, as you saw, right, this is a very big thing, and most of you sort of raised their hands. So um, this is not new in some sense, right? There is definitely information out there from the FTC and from, uh, from various places which gives you information about technical support scams and tells you what you should be on the lookout for. Uh, and there's actually even videos, right, of people who interacted with technical support scams while recording or maybe recording the audio, maybe even recording their desktops and uploading it on YouTube for sort of entertainment purposes. Uh, so if, if, you know, if there's all of that stuff out there, why am I here? And so, right, why are you all in this room? 
Um, and when we were looking into this problem in summer 2015, we read all of these blog posts and these articles, um, and we really had still a lot of questions that were unanswered, right? So for example, for example, how do consumers find these scammers and their phone numbers, right? If now the new scam involves me calling the scammer, how exactly do I find this number and why am I convinced to calling it, right? Uh, what is the infrastructure used by technical support scammers in terms of their hosting and in terms of their phone numbers? Um, how many scams are out there at any given point in time, right? So how many groups are operating in the wild? How much money are scammers making, right? So maybe there is a more sort of precise way of uh, arriving at a dollar figure than what our Technica is quoting. Um, are these people that are doing these you know, technical support scams, are they just doing this as a side business? Or are they actually, do they belong in a large call center and they do this as, as their daily job, right? And if you do get the user as far as calling you, right, uh, and giving you access to your machine, how exactly do you convince him that he's infected with malware in order for, for him to sort of to, to be willing to pay, right, um, that uh, uh, disinfection fee to you, right? And so in the first part of this talk, I'm going to talk to you about finding scams in the wild. And um, in most of these sort of aforementioned you know, articles and blog posts, there was really not all that much information as to how users would find themselves on a page that was a technical support scam page, right? So you would, um, it's really hard based on this sort of, you know, uh, on these testimonials, to go about actually intentionally finding technical support scams, right? If we want to study them, we want to intentionally find as many of them as possible, right? So how can we find as many as possible technical support scams in the wild? And by, by reading through these and sort of through our own sort of past work, we realized that malicious ads was the key here, right? So there were a lot of people who would sort of, they would say, I was browsing the internet and suddenly I found myself on a page that told me that my computer has a problem and, and it asked me to call a number, right? And so through this, you sort of understand that what does this suddenly mean, right? Probably this is some sort of malicious ad, right, that essentially redirected their browser or through a pop-up while they were visiting some other website um, and then, you know, it was convincing enough for them to actually call the scammers. And so the question is now, if we can find technical support scams via ads, how do we find malicious ads, right? So I just moved the problem, I didn't solve it. Um, and our eventual goal was to create these high toxicity URL streams, right? Yes, we will have crawlers that will automatically crawl tens of thousands of pages on a daily basis, but we still can't crawl aimlessly, right, and hope for the best. We have to access websites that are more likely than your average website to be involved in something malicious. And from our own past work, which I will tell you a lot about today, we chose these two services as a way of finding malicious ads, right? We chose domain parking and ad-based URL shortening services. So um, in domain parking, what happens is that uh, there are these companies that gather these massive domain portfolios from people that own domains and are not using them. And what they do is they place ads on those domains, all right? And so uh, in theory, what will happen is that the user will come on those domains, they will see the ads, they will click on an ad, right? And then what will happen is that the domain parking company will split the commission that they get from the ads with the owner of that domain, right? So, domain, so people that own these large portfolios have mandatory incentives to park their domains with these domain parking companies, right? And so there are dedicated parking companies that do this, like Cedo, but there's also generic hosters like Bluehost and GoDaddy that actually uh, use parking as a way of making a little bit of extra money. So in theory, this is how domain parking looks like. You land on a website like buyairlinetickets.com that is parked, and these ads are created on the fly, right, based on the keywords that, are, that comprise the domain name, perhaps keywords that the domain owner chose when he registered their domains with the domain parking company. So, and you see here, buy, buy cheap airline tickets and so on, and if you would click on that, you would go somewhere, and in principle, um, the domain parking company would make some money and they would give some of that to the domain owner, right? So that's the theory of domain parking. In practice, we have to ask ourselves, if a domain is unused, like buyairlinetickets.com, how exactly do users find these domains in order to click on those ads, right, and then make money for, for the domain parker and for the domain owner, right? Um, and the answer lies a little bit in the historical context. So domain parking services flourished when there was a lot of type-in traffic, right? And type-in traffic really means that you go to the URL bar of your browser 
and you start typing domains, right? This is before the era where you had this tight integration of search engines in your browser with a dedicated right, search box or the actual URL bar doubling as a search box. Right? So a lot of people would, you know, would want to find uh, how to buy airline tickets, and they would really write, buy airline tickets. And in some cases of Internet Explorer in the past, Internet Explorer would actually fill in various TLDs for you. So you would write, buy airline tickets, hit enter, and then Internet Explorer would try to go to .com, and if that doesn't work, go to .net, and so on. Right? So this is really the time when these companies flourished, because people would find these domains in that way. Right? The problem, however, is that today we have much less type-in traffic. Right? Most of us actually work, uh, sort of browse with the help of, of a search engine pretty much all the time. Right? And so if you have less type-in traffic, you also have less chances of making money as a domain parking company. There's just less traffic coming to your website. Um, what this means is that, unfortunately, these companies have started sort of doubling in a little bit of shadier activities, right? So they are willing to take risks by collaborating with advertising networks that are not exactly of stellar quality, uh, and they're willing to turn a blind eye to park domains that are obviously abusive, right? And one of the types of obviously abusive domain names, other than uh, malware delivery domain names, are actually domain squatting uh, domains, squatting domains, right? So, and uh, we know from related work that actually domain squatting uh, uses parking as its favorite monetization method, right? So a lot, of a lot of domain squatters will register domains and they will park them in order to capitalize uh, from the users who land on them, right? And so if I can just tell you briefly about uh, domain squatting, right? Because again, I'm moving the goalpost. We were searching for technical support scams. That we said that we'll find them through ads, through malicious ads. Now I'm telling you that we'll find the malicious ads through domain parking services. And the question is, how do I find domains that are parked, right? So that's where we are right now. So what we know is that um, in type of squatting, which is a type of domain squatting, where essentially what scammers do is that they register mistypes of popular domains, right? With the idea is that you will mistype as you're typing Google, right? You will, let's say you will type Google. And instead of getting an error, you will actually go to the website that they control, right? And so there's many types of domain squatting. There is typo squatting and bit squatting and sound squatting, right? And I will only sort of talk about uh, typo squatting today, which is sort of that example that I gave you with Google. So again, the idea is very simple. Humans make typos. You type in a URL bar. You can make a typo while you type in a URL bar. And so you could hit enter before you realize that you've done a typo, right? So you could end up asking for sites like Fugle, the F is next to the G on your QWERTY keyboard, or Facebook.com with two Fs, or Twitter.com with a missing R, right? And so what happens is, again, that scammers go out, register these, and now they can give you content. And you will get a page back instead of a 404 error. So uh, and in, in past work, uh, people have modeled what kinds of typos can we expect. So we can have double character uh, typos, where you have example with two Xs, or omitted character with a missing X. Neighboring character, right, where you accidentally mistype example and you just hit the W next to it. Uh, forgetting dots where you, you forget to type the dot in between the dub 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 part and the actual website. So people can actually register this, which is distinctly different than example.com. Um, and character permutations, right? Where you type your A before your X, so you have E example or something along those lines, right? So I've given you a lot of information, but now we're actually able to create our, our first high toxicity URL stream, right? If we visit enough type of squatting URLs, we will actually get a large fraction of these visits redirected to parking services because that's what type of squatters do. A fraction of our, of our visits to parking services will be exposed to low quality ad networks, and a fraction of those will actually lead us to technical support scams, right? Or that's the hope. Um, and this may sort of, you know, there's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction, but if you do this enough, you actually get large numbers, right? Um, and there's many more to say about uh, domain parking companies. Uh, you're welcome to read this paper that we published a couple of years back if you want to know more about them. So, um, and we have in our, as I'll show you in the system, we have essentially two high toxicity URL streams, right? And the first one is driven by typo squatting. The second is driven by ad-based URL shortening services, all right? So let me tell you first what is a traditional URL shortening service. Who knows Bitly? Most of you, great, right? So you know that the whole thing that Bitly does is it takes a long URL, it creates a short URL, and you ask for, when you ask for that short URL, it sends you a 302 uh, redirection message that takes you from the short to the long, right? And so now you can fit your links in your Twitter, or you can print them on printed media where you have sort of constrained physical dimensions. That's really all that Bitly and Bitly-like companies do, right? 
So um, ad-based URL shorteners do exactly the same, but they actually bring advertising into the mix, right? So what happens now is that you take a, a long URL and you shorten it. Again, this is AdFly, which is one of these ad-based URL shortening services. So when you click on that link, now you are no longer transparently directed to the long URL. What happens is that you're exposed to an ad that you have to see for a few seconds before you can click continue when you will then go to the long URL, right? And the way this works is that the service will again give a commission of the advertising money to the creators of the short links, right? So you have an incentive to create as many short links as possible and get as much traffic for these short links as possible in order to make as much commission as possible, all right? And this is how this thing looks in practice. So you will see here at the very top we have this ad fly banner, and at the very bottom we have an ad. So you can already see that it's probably not a very benign ad, right? It's this is a random website that says that your download is ready and asks me to download it, right? I didn't ask for a download, I'm just trying to go to FTC, right? So, um, so if, I, if you would interact anywhere here, chances are that something bad will happen, right? After a few seconds, you get that yellow button on the top right that says skip ad. So you can click that, and then you can go to the long URL, right? And so we have done some work on that space a couple of years back in dub, 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 and we had found that a lot of these uh, ad-based URL shorting services, they're actually again doubling with shady advertising networks, right? So we again have enough information to create our second high toxicity, high toxicity uh, stream of URLs. We visit short URLs of ad-based URL shorteners. A fraction of these visits will be exposed to low quality advertising networks, and a fraction of those will lead us to technical support scams, all right? So we actually now have all of the sort of the, the parts in place in order to show you the infrastructure that we built. So we have at the very top these two streams. We have the shortened URLs, and we have the popular domains that are then modified through type of squatting models. And this sort of stream of URLs, they are visited every day by our crawlers, okay? We called our crawlers Robovic, which is short for robotic victim, okay? Uh, and we deploy various crawlers around the world, and I'll show you the results of that. So a fraction of these will actually take us into advertising networks, right? Either directly or via parking services. And here we have sort of a pool of potentially shady advertising networks, right? So a fraction of these will actually take us to technical support scam pages, which will be a page, as you will see, that will tell us that our computer is infected and we have to call a number. And then we sort of switch mediums. We have to pick up the phone. And then we start interacting with scammers, OK? And what's important about this infrastructure is that actually we're not using typo squatting or domain parking or ad-based URL shorting services as a direct way of finding technical support scams. We're merely using them as a way of entering into a space of potentially malicious ads, right? So what this means is that there can be other potential scam sources, like ads on websites that we do not visit, or spam emails, or social networks, or malicious browser extensions. And as long as these operate via malicious advertising networks, we should be able to get to the same targets without actually directly tapping on them, right? And we explain in our paper, and I can tell you offline, why we think that this is sort of a more attractive solution than directly linking to scam pages, OK? So um, we've been running this infrastructure since September 2015. It's still running. We're really sort of, uh, we're really dedicated to keep this running for as long as possible, and I'll show you what we've done with this. These numbers are already sort of out of date. They, you know, they're out of date every day. Uh, but um, we have gathered more than 9,000 unique domain names and more than 2,000 unique phone numbers. Uh, that are all part of technical support scams. The statistics that I'm going to give you in the next slides will be based on shorter numbers, which are just the numbers that we calculated for our NDSS paper. So, and now that we know how to find these, let's actually see what these look like, right? So this is a page, a technical support scam page that the user lands on. And um, you will see here that this page is imitating the warning message of Google Chrome. That's what you get when you're about to visit a site that is in the safe browsing blacklist. So uh, it tells you that you have a problem, firewalls, Trojans, problems, problems, problems. Please visit your nearest Windows service center, which doesn't exist, or call this number, <laughs> right? So what will, you know, what will happen? Chances are you will call this number, right? And this is very interesting from a UI perspective, right? We're, we're sort of teaching people to really sort of honor and follow what these UIs are saying when they're part of their browsers, but now scammers just take them and recreate them to tell to the user something different, right? To actually use it as part of a scam. Another example is the imitation of the Windows blue screen of death, right? Where again, the scammers are just telling you some mumbo jumbo about error in your registry failure, error, error. 
and it asks you to contact the Microsoft certified technicians at the toll-free number, right? And it's actually, we saw that pretty much in 99.9% .9 of the cases, these numbers are always toll-free, right? Because it's one less inhibition between actually calling them, right? Between you and calling them. So we have more colorful variations of the blue screen of death. We have a, a colorful sort of Windows flag, and we have a fake taskbar notification that's actually just part of your browser. It is not something that, you, that your Windows sort of, you know, popped up while you were there. We have a supposed uh, security essentials that just scan your machine, right? It finds problems, and again, there's nothing to download. All you have to do is call that phone number in order to get, you know, your computer fixed. And people can really be very creative, so you can have a failed Java update, and you can call your administrator that number. Um, you can have a old screen, like screensaver looking thing of Microsoft Windows with a, you know, a pop-up that says that um, the problem is caused by some unusual activity, please call this number. And in addition to sort of, you know, to seeing these messages, typically you have audio that goes together with these messages, right? And that's our mistake for allowing pages to play arbitrary audio, right? So let me see if, it, if this will work. Um, I'm just going to show you some examples. Important security message. Please call the number provided as soon as possible. You will be guided for the removal of the adware spyware virus on your computer. Right. And this sort of goes on like that. Then you have sort of a category of annoying. Um, if I can again find my mouse. Right. So imagine this repeating in loop forever, right, on your machine. Uh, and, you know, what I just called downright maddening. So, you know, again, this can be playing all the time while you're captured, you know, on that page. And just showing you sort of stills and audio doesn't actually communicate, right, what the scammers are doing. So for that reason, I have two videos that I want to show you. With some luck, I will be able to. Um, so, let's see. work now? Yes. Okay. So I apologize for the sort of watermark in the middle, which is because the video capturing software was... Okay. So I'm, I'm going to sort of walk you through that one. So again, I just visited the technical support scam page, right? Again, we have a, an audio that immediately plays, right, that tells you that you have a critical error from Microsoft. And you will see this pop-up here in the front that is a JavaScript pop-up, right? Um, that tells you that you have a problem, you have to call this number and so on. And these pop-ups are there in actually to make it very hard for you to navigate away because most of these pop-ups are actually blocking. You have, to, you have to do them away before you can navigate away. So I will click on OK. Okay, so I clicked on OK and you see this other pop-up underneath, right? This is actually not a real pop-up. This is drawn by the page, okay? And you will see there at the very top that it says support.microsoft.com on that pop-up, right? And so what are they exactly trying to do here, right? We are clearly not on a Microsoft.com web page, but this fake alert is showing that, you know, that it's supposedly coming from Microsoft.com. And you will see why they're doing this the second that I try to interact with this fake pop-up. with the virus and spyware. This virus is sending your credit card details. Okay. So the second that I tried to interact with that fake pop-up, that was actually an event handler that put my browser into full screen mode. Okay. In full screen mode, your URL bar is hidden. So what the scammers do, the second you put in full screen mode, they actually draw their own fake URL bar, okay? So you see at the very top, now it says support at Microsoft.com, right? So for all intents and purposes, and we are currently on support at Microsoft.com, right? With a page, with an alert from Microsoft.com that tells us that we have to call this number, right? So this is as trustworthy as you can get, right? And so you will see there that it says press escape for full screen. That's pretty much your only cue that this is full screen. And you will see what happens when I actually press escape. 
Please call us immediately at the toll-free number listed, so that our support engineers can walk you through the removal process over the phone. If you close this page before calling us, we will be forced to disable your computer to prevent further damage to our network. Right. So they found some bug of Chrome, right, where essentially your escape is probably, again, enough of an event handler to, again, put you back into full-screen mode, right? So you cannot escape this full-screen mode. You have to pretty much find your task manager, kill your browser, open it up again, clear your recently visited websites, and that's the only way of escaping this, you know, this pop-up. Right? So that's sort of example number one. And I'll show you example number two. You may see here a mouse moving, or I hope you can see a mouse moving. Um, that's why you, you use that. Sometimes that's not work. Let's see. That's my mouse. Okay, so I think the video is just not, just not playing. Okay. All right. So you, you can see now a mouse moving. Um, and this is not, can you see this or is it just me? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so that's not the real mouse of the user, right? That's a fake mouse that they are sort of animating on the page. And what they're doing is that they have actually selected a custom CSS selector. So if you try to put your mouse in the page, it immediately just turns invisible, right? So you lose your mouse the second you put it in the page. And the second you try to interact with the page, you get another pop-up that's sort of DOS looking, right? That again tells you to have a problem. And again, yet more pop-ups, right, that you cannot interact with. If you try to interact with them, you will get, get more pop-ups, right, of the same variety, right? So again, we are really, you know, this is not sort of, you know, this is not some small time, you know, someone made a static HTML page, um, and that's that, right? Th these can be very advanced um, UIs that are abusing whatever is the most recent problem in, in, your, in your popular browsers in order to, you know, to trap the user on the page and stop them from navigating away and make it very likely that they will actually call. All right. So let me, show, let me give you some hard numbers now. So here you will see, this is the, on the top graph, we have the number of scam domains, unique scam domains that we could find on a weekly basis from September when we started running this uh, until uh, April of 2016 when we made this graph, or a little bit further uh, than that. Um, so at the top we have number of unique scam domains, and on the bottom we have number of unique scam phone numbers, okay? Um, and the y-axis is our log 10. So the first thing that you can see, if you focus on the top one and the solid line, is that we have a growth, we have growth, right? So we go from hundreds of unique scam domains on a weekly basis to actually thousands, right, at the time when we made our graph, right? So this is clearly something that's working and more people are getting into it. If you look at phone numbers, um, we see something different. We see that actually these phone numbers, that their number cannot scale uh, in the same way that the domains can scale, right? And why? Because it's, it's much harder, there is much less toll-free phone numbers to get than there are domains that you can create, right? So clearly this already sort of indicates that this may be a, a pressure point for this CAM, right? Maybe we can go after the phone numbers instead of going after the domain names, all right? So the second thing that I want to show you is if you look, at, for example, at the top again, at the, at the dotted lines, um, these are our crawlers that are not running on our campus like the solid line ones, but they're running on AWS and on Linode, right? Two sort of one big and one medium uh, cloud providers. What you will see here is that <clears throat> the very same software with this very same seed URLs is actually finding a tenth of the scams that are out there, right? And the reason for this is really that scammers are evading, right? There is really no legitimate scenario where a real user would be navigating the web from IP addresses belonging to AWS's address space or to IP addresses belonging to Linode's address space. But it's already a clear signal that will take away, right, 90% of the scams. They will just be hiding from you, okay? And it's pretty much the same thing with phone numbers, okay? If you're not navigating from an address space that they don't have blacklisted, um, <clears throat> or if you are navigating from an address space that they have blacklisted, you will be finding much less than there is out there to find, right? And this will be true not just for technical support scams, but pretty much for anything out there, anything malicious. So if, you, if you're working on some project that involves scanning the web, probably you shouldn't be using public clouds to do that, okay? Um, and another way sort of reinforcing that is to show you a Venn diagram of the unique phone numbers um, that our tools were able to find. So you see here, our campus server, just by itself, was able to find 95% of the phone numbers that all three scanners found, right? So we gained very little 
in terms of uh, you know, domains and phone numbers by running extra scanners and having to do with that extra overhead. All right? um, so in that duration, the duration where we wrote this paper, um, we found a total of 1,600 toll-free numbers that were abused in technical support scams. Right? Uh, and we were able to trace this back to 15 providers. However, 93.5% of these numbers actually belong to four providers. Right? So Twilio, Wiltel, Ring Revenue, and Bandwidth. And again, this shows that we can probably tackle a big part of the scam just by going to these providers and saying, you have to do better with how you allocate your toll-free numbers, right? 77% of these numbers were activated less than a year ago, so these are not old numbers. There's not sort of residual trust associated with them, and there's no vanity terms matching in terms of technical support and the numbers that the scammers use, all right? So it's like, you know, you can call, you know, um, um, dial, you know, 1-800-DIAL-WINDOWS, right? That, that kind of. Um, so another thing that we didn't expect to find and we did find is that actually scammers are abusing uh, what's called a paper call service, right? So paper call services allow you to create models where you show different phone numbers to different users on your website, right? So let's say that I'm running a business, which is sort of, I'm, 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 I want to have clients from the entire U.S., but I want to be sending to a different call center when you're calling me from the east side versus when you're calling me from the west side, right? I, I just can't show a single phone number that is good for everyone, right? So what these companies do legitimately is that they fingerprint your browser, right? They will find out if you're Chrome or Firefox, what version, where, which part of the world are you, various other things. They will send this to the server side, and based on server side heuristics, they will then choose a specific number to show you, okay? So scammers are actually abusing this, what is called paper call services, in order to get a fresh stream of URL num of, of, of phone numbers, right? Because they can just create a single campaign, right, or multiple identical campaigns, and they can say, yes, yes, I want a dynamic number, right? And they can get, you know, new number after new number. So it's very hard to blacklist these phone numbers, right? Because they are used for a short time, and they return back to the pool of numbers. Um, we're able to do some grouping. So you can see here clusters of, uh, of domains, um, uh, I'm sorry, domains are the gray ones, and four numbers are the black nodes. And the size of each node uh, is related to, to the number of edges, right? And you can see here we have some sort of fairly well-connected components. So we have these six phone numbers there in the middle that are used by many different scam sites, right? Uh, and this, you could use this in order to sort of uh, to, to group different websites together as part of a single campaign, right? These are the same likely individuals that are operating these different phone numbers and different websites, right? And we have some information about these clusters in our paper. Um, in terms of how these URLs look like, right, um, we were, so we, we kind of classified them in three different categories. The first one is short and readable. So these are domains that people register, like computerwarningmessage.com or do not close.website and inputerror.net, right? These are short and clear, and they have to do with, you know, with the error at hand. In the second one, we actually see that they're creating these ginormous uh, you know, domains, which are actually all subdomains. And the reason why they're doing this is they want, the, they want to trick your browser's UI. Um, it's a little bit complicated. I'm happy to tell you offline why they're doing this. But the point is that you can see these you know, humongous domains on your browser if you land on such a scam site. And the final one is that they can actually sometimes abuse content distribution networks. They can get their free tier service, and then they can host their technical support scams without even having to pay for hosting, right? So, and then they can pretty much just take that URL and connect it with a malicious ad and you, you know, pretty much just expose the user to, uh, to a technical support scam in that way. So we wanted to understand how well current blacklists work, right? If you were to, to take all the good blacklists out there and say, okay, I will pass all of these domains through them and see who knows about them, right? What would we get? So we found that if you sort of first limit yourself to publicly available mal malware domain lists, like HP hosts, SANS, malware domains, and so on, less than 7% of the domains that we were able to capture with Robovic were part of these public blacklists, okay? So horrible, right? Now, if you go to VirusTotal, which is sort of, you know, this place where there's 60 different AV engines and they can all scan, you know, the URL that you're submitting, only 64% of the URLs were detectable, right? And it's really important to understand that this is only, because we're dealing pretty much with a collective knowledge of security, right? 60 different AVs, all scanning all our, our domains, and, you know, more than a third would just fly under the radar. Right. A, a, a real user cannot install 60 different AVs on their machine. Right. They're, in fact, not supposed to. Okay. 
And I want to tell you what the reason for this is, right? And I, and I think that this reason is a game changer, right? Technical support scams are, are breaking the mold of malicious pages, right? Of what we, what we have associated with maliciousness in the past, right? So a technical support scam page, it doesn't have any malicious executables that it tries to push on you, right? It doesn't have any JavaScript that tries to exploit the vulnerabilities in your browser, right? Um, and it doesn't have any forms, right, that you're supposed to put in your username and password, right? So three of the great things, three of the great categories of maliciousness that we've been searching for, and we've been building tools for, and the industry has been building tools for, they don't match, right? Why? Because half of the maliciousness is delivered over your browser, and the other half is delivered over the phone, right? So all of these fly under the radar, and that's why we need sort of specific solutions to technical support scams. Now, the special thing with technical support scams is that as a defender, you have two chances. You can either blacklist the domain, or you can blacklist the phone number. Right. And what we did is we essentially went out and we found websites that have phone numbers and complaints, right, where people just go out there and say, okay, I got a call from this number, it was malicious, it was a scammer, it was an IRS scammer, whatever, right. Uh, and we searched for our phone numbers in these lists, right. And there's also apps like uh, Mr. Number and uh, Haya and Truecaller that will show you a pop-up on the fly on your smartphone when you receive a call that says, do not answer this phone because it's coming from a phone number that we know is malicious, right? Or we know is, is, a, is a scammer, right? What we found is that even the best websites, right, they would cover less than 20% individually of our, uh, of our 1,600 phone numbers. And if you put everything together, right, if you were to scan, if you were to install all five apps on your phone, right, and if you were to look a technical support scam number on all websites before you call it, you could still only stop 27% of the phone numbers. Yes? Do you have Mr. Number listed Yes. So uh, Mr. Number on the top is actually the website, and Mr. Number at the bottom is an app. Okay. Right. Um, so what we saw actually is that, and we mentioned this in the paper, there is a discrepancy between the two. And our best guess is that because the website is crowdsourced, they probably have some internal procedure of, of validating all the complaints before they actually you know, move them to their app, right? And that internal validation procedure clearly misses, right, the majority of the stuff that they had on their website. Do they make a claim of 1.5 million members in the app? Uh, yes, so these are the claim sizes, whichever we could get from the website. So sometimes we can you know, talk about the lookups or, or volumes, whatever the website gives us, right? Sometimes it's unknown, depending on the website. But this is pretty much what you would find if you would go out looking for phone number blacklist today, okay? So we know now, you know, their phone numbers and their domain names. Let's talk about money. Right? That's an important thing, right? Um, how much does a typical scammer make, right? Um, and we wanted to, to, to answer this in a more sort of precise way. So what we found while looking at this, we actually were able to find 142 scam pages that were revealing to the world their dashboards, okay? Uh, they were not supposed to do that, but they were doing that, okay? So what we did is we, we added these new crawlers that would crawl these dashboards once a minute for two months, okay? And every time we would essentially get the IP address of all the other users that were located on that website at that time, right? So by doing this, we could calculate how many other people other than us, right, other than our crawlers, would land on these technical support scam pages on a daily basis. So we found that on average, a technical support scam website receives 224 visitors per day, okay? Unique IP addresses. Now, I will tell, first tell you about this assumption and I will explain it, okay? So under the assumption that 3% of these users call and purchase this scammer support, right? So out of 100 people that go on this website, three of them call this number and are convinced to buy the, the, the package, the, the support package, the scammers are making more than $2,000 for every day that the website is online. Okay, so this is a great, a huge number. Of course, you have to, to, rem to subtract the advertising costs, but this is a a clearly a big, a big number. So um, for the two months that we're monitoring these domains, if we would sort of follow this math, we would arrive that for the 142 scam domains, the scammers were stand to making, they stood to make $9.7 million, okay? Now let me tell you why this 3%, okay? We actually don't know how many of the users that call, that, that land on such a page we'll call a technical support scam, right? With the collaboration of a, of, of a large telco, we could get this number more accurately, but we, we don't have that yet. What we do have is we have related work from UC Santa Barbara a couple of years ago, 
where they were studying fake antivirus, right? Where you would download your machine, it would say that they have found this and this problem, and you have to buy the full version in order for that software to clean up your problems, right? In that paper, by breaking into the databases of these bad guys, they found that of the people that download a fake AV, 3% unlock the full version by paying for it, okay? So that's why we chose that same percentage, right? My gut feeling is that this is actually much higher, right? Because we are actually dealing with a human person on the other side of the phone, right? That is speaking to you and is willing to sort of maneuver based on your doubts. And therefore, I have, I'm pretty sure I would bet money that more than 3% of the users who land on these pages are actually purchasing technical support scams, uh, are actually purchasing support packages, right? And with that, we can move to the second part of the talk, which is meeting the scammers. So even after all the statistics that I gave you and all the cool sort of videos, we still don't know what happens when a user calls his phone number, right? We don't know what takes place, what are these scammers doing, how are they gaining access, and how are they convincing people, right? So what we did in order to find that, we actually did 60 calls to 60 different phone numbers, right? Uh, IRB approved, okay? So, we pretended to be clueless users, right, who just saw a warning and were just reacting on that warning. And we gave them access to disposable VMs that we had interacted with for a little bit, like added stuff on the desktop, navigated to a few websites, just so that it doesn't look like it's fresh out of the box, right? And we recorded the video, audio, and network traces of our interactions with them, right? So pretty much everything, okay? And we, we, you know, we reported a bunch of statistics in the paper. I will only cover a few of them today. So the first one is the duration of the call in terms of the second that the scammer picks up and says, hello, you've reached technical support, to the second that he asks for money, okay? And so you can see that this is kind of a nice normal distribution with the, with the exception of that outlier over there, right? So um, on average, a scammer takes about 17 minutes, right, to convince you, first to convince you that you have a problem, and then to ask for a specific dollar amount in order to solve this problem, okay? Now, this normal distribution of, you know, has certain interesting properties, Right? And in general, we would expect that 99.7% right, that of the observations should fall in the mean plus minus three standard deviations. Okay? Again, I'm ignoring the outlier. So what this means is that if we go to the mean and we add three standard deviations, it is highly unlikely that someone is speaking on the phone for more than 41 minutes with a scammer and hasn't paid. Right? Because that moment where the scammer would ask to pay, would ask to be paid, it would come earlier than this 41 minutes. Right? So if you're operating out of, for example, telephone metadata, you could in principle say, I am Verizon, I know that my scammers are, are my, my, my customers, my subscribers are, are victims to this, maybe I should prioritize interacting with these subscribers that have spoken for more than 41 minutes uh, with a technical support scam phone number, all right? And this graph should also give you a, an indication of the amount of work involved in order to do this experiment, right? So just for, for this part of the paper and for this part of the work, we had to interact for over 22 hours with scammers on the phone, okay? So this is not something that you can do in one afternoon, all right? So um, in terms of requested charges, what we found out is that scammers typically don't quote you a single amount, right? They will give you a one-time support, a yearly support, a three-year support, sometimes maybe a lifetime support, right? If we're making things up, we might as well make things up for the rest of our lives, right? <laughs> so, uh, and you will see here that uh, these are the CDFs of these prices asked. Uh, the average ask is $290, right? Again, $300 for completely necessary services performed, um, with a range starting from $69.99 or $69 to almost $1,000, right? And you can see here that this is sort of a skewed right, so most people would typically try to stay under $300 in their ask, okay? So now the next question is where are the scammers located, right? So where are they sitting when they're performing these scams? And again, anecdotally, people would say India because people sound like that, right? But we can't write that in the paper, okay? So uh, what we did is we actually reverse engineered slightly the, uh, the protocols from um, the remote administration tools that the scammers are using because these are publicly available. This is like TeamViewer, connect to my PC, and so on. And for some of them, we were able actually to identify packets that contain the IP address of the remote party, okay? For those, we were able to place 85% in India, 10% in the US, and another 5% to Costa Rica, all right? So, and something that I, you know, I didn't mention earlier is that for this scam to work, you need for your call center to speak the same language as the one that you're showing to the user who sees the pop-up, right? 
So we saw by analyzing the IP addresses earlier of the victims that would land on the technical support scam sites that they were typically from the English-speaking parts of the world, right? Because when they call, someone who speaks their language must be able to convince them into, you know, into paying money, okay? And so the next question is, are they working in groups or are they doing this sort of, you know, individually as a sort of a, a, a you know, to supplement their income? So the first experiment that we did is I asked my grad students to actually listen through all 60 calls again. Um, and instead of focusing on the person speaking, focus on the background, okay? If on the background we would hear other people talking about malware, security, windows, and so on, it means that there's other people in this person's vicinity pretty much just saying the same stuff to others, right? And we found that in 62% of the cases that was indeed, right, true, right? We were able to find that. And based on that, we decided that maybe let's do something a bit more specific, right? A bit more uh, precise. Because you can have better VoIP equipment that will filter out background sounds as you're speaking to your victim. And people, scammers, actually muted themselves occasionally where they were not talking to us, okay? So they would just, they didn't want us to hear what was happening in the background, you know, while they were not talking. So, and we came up with this very simple experiment where we used pizza in order to estimate the capacity of technical support call centers, and I'm sure that this doesn't answer many questions. So the long description is that I gathered a group of 20 volunteers and I offered them pizza in order to gather them in one room, okay? Um, we educated them about technical support scams. These were mostly undergraduates at Stony Brook. And we gave them a sheet of 10 phone numbers, all in the same order, and a list of fake personas where they could choose one, okay? because you don't want to be talking to the scammer who says, what's your name? It's like, uh, uh, John Smith, you know, that doesn't work, right? Um, so with the synchronization of a stopwatch, all 20 volunteers would call a specific number at once, okay? Those that got a line were instructed to stay on that line for 90 seconds. Those that didn't get a line were instructed to keep calling until the 90 seconds expired, okay? The maximum number of people who were able to get a line, right, during that minute and a half essentially is a lower bound on the capacity of the call center, right? Under the very realistic assumption that a scammer cannot be scamming two people at once because they actually have to talk to you, okay? So they cannot be sort of pausing you and unpausing you left and right, okay? So using that, we did this for only for 10 calls because, you know, again, it takes a, sort of a lot of synchronizing effort to get 20 people in a room and get them to stay there for longer than an hour, for example, um, right? So we found that uh, the average call center right, was housing 11 people that were ready to take calls. And we found as little as five people and as many as 19, right? So there were actually call centers out there that pretty much consumed our capacity, right? 19 out of the 20 people would, could speak at the same time calling that phone number, right? This is, again, a nice technique that could be used, for example, by the FTC because it allows you to prioritize, right? If I have 10 technical support scams going on, I can find which, and which ones are the most prolific ones and I can focus on these first, right, before going after the sort of the small fry, okay? So, um, and in the third part, which is sort of the forward, current and forward looking, uh, we're, as I said earlier in the beginning of this talk, we're really dedicated to providing intelligence on active technical support scams. So what my students did uh, is that uh, they made this uh, dashboard, which I hope I will be able to show you. Um, maybe I'll switch, give me one second. So we made these dashboards here that essentially this dashboard is tapping uh, into what the crawlers are finding on a daily basis, okay? And it's essentially grouping all the domains that, are that we're finding that are technical support scam domains. And an analyst could essentially interact with any one of those. So you could choose to, for example, click on this uh, firewall, uh, firewall 25217whatever.info, right? And, and you can get information about this. So you can get the IP address of the domain, the phone numbers that were listed on this page. You can see what the user would have seen uh, once he landed on this page. So you can see you know, what sort of technical support template they're using. And what you could do, for example, is you can click on the IP address. Um, let's hope that this is going to work. Yeah. And you now get essentially a, a graph of all the other technical support scam domains that are hosted on the same IP address, right, as discovered by our tools, right? So you can see here that we have you know, like breach something.info and syntax something.club 
and breach again with another thing and virus OS, right? And all of these are currently hosted in the same IP address, right? So again, this can, this can be used to prioritize takedowns. Let's take down the servers that are hosting the most technical support scams at any given point in time. And another thing we're working on right now is that we're building these um, uh, virtual machine environments because we've noticed that technical support scams can actually also manifest through binary malware, where you install a piece of malware, and instead of sort of, for example, you know, being a crypto locker, it locks your machine, but it tells you that you need to call this phone number because there is some problem with your windows, right? So we want to understand if these are the same scammers who are just running two shops, or if they are different groups of people, right, uh, that are just, each one is specializing either in web uh, scams or binary scams. So, okay. Okay. So with that, I would like to conclude, um, and, you know, I sincerely believe that technical support scams are the newest addition to the arsenal of social engineering attacks, right? And they're sufficiently different, like I said, from previous malicious pages that they do not, that they cannot be detected by the existing monitors of academia and industry. Um, and they are important enough to be costing users millions of dollars on a yearly basis. Um, in our work, we essentially developed the infrastructure to track and analyze technical support scams. And through our interaction with the scammers, we're able to show the breadth of techniques that they use that I didn't mention in, this, in today's talk. Uh, the magnitude of the problem, potential avenues for solutions, like the, uh, you know, like the sort of pressure point of toll-free phone numbers and the potential prioritization of takedowns. Uh, and we have a lot of work ahead of us, and I would be happy to talk to you offline if you're interested in this project. So thank you. Yes. I'm curious, how do people pay for these technical support services, and might the credit card network be a pinch point? It's a credit card, typically. Um, and there's this facade that is created in order for this transaction to look legitimate, right? So we know, for example, that um, you call them, right? And you give them permission to connect to your machine. And then you ask them, essentially, to provide their services for a specific dollar amount that you agreed upon, right? And then you volunteer your credit card, right? You accept the charge. From our research, we didn't show malicious stuff happening after you gave the credit card. So they're just doing random things that are unnecessary, right? And at the end, chances are that they will ask you to verify that your computer runs faster than before, right? So there's this transaction, right, where it's very hard for you to be able to go back and say, but, 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 I saw this pop-up. Like, you cannot see this pop-up anymore. It's on a domain that was up just for a single day, right? So there is a lot of plausible deniability in terms of calling this a scam. So you have to analyze this end to end. Yes. To, to what extent were you able to determine whether these call centers were set up just for the scammers or were perhaps these legitimate call centers with, that were being, um, you know, there were some rogue employees or rogue managers uh, running there as well? This is very hard to quantify. Um, so I can just give you some anecdotal information. Um, uh, on a couple of these websites where we looked for our toll-free phone numbers, whether they were present or not, we saw that people were complaining about the phone number that we had, but complaining about an IRS scam instead of a technical support scam. Right? So we know we can guess as much as that the same call center can be used for different scams, right? depending on the time of the year right? or the time of the day. But I couldn't tell you if these are sort of you know, dedicated call centers that are used for scams or if they are sort of you know, repurposed because of a crooked manager. Yeah. Sure. But, but you didn't see any that were like handling calls for banks or anything at the same time? or We wouldn't you, you know how know, to look for know. that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Slightly different question. Um, to which extent do ad blockers and um, other privacy enhancing tools completely shield people away from these? Right. I think to a large extent. Uh, so we didn't, uh, we didn't do this experiment to see, right, um, um, how many scams would we not see, right, where they're for ad blockers. But the whole point is that, you know, we were able to find the scams via malicious advertising, right? So if you block the entire advertising avenue, then you will block a very large chunk of scams, right? However, I can personally, again, anecdotally attest that I'm running ad blockers on my machine, and I have occasionally seen my own pop-up. That's just, you know, it was just a series of redirections that was not covered by any of the regular expressions of the ad blocker. Yes. list of uh, shortened URLs? Uh, so we, we gathered some online and we created the others, right? And what's important to understand is that um, when you visit a short URL, even though the destination will be fixed, 
the actual ad will be dynamic, right? So you can visit the same short URL 20 times and chances are that you will get, you know, n different ads. So that, that was our composition. We created some and we gathered the rest online. Yeah. I guess that's it. Oh, yes. Uh, in, your, in your research, uh, you, you tracked how long before the scammer asked for, you know, asked right. for money, right? Um, at, at that point, did your uh, researchers continue to engage? Like, how, how hard did they press, and after what point did they give right. up? Right. So what, what, what we did is that we didn't want to, um, to pay scammers, right? So because we were doing 60 calls, if we wanted to get some sort of, sort of statistically significant numbers, we'd have to pay at least 30 of them. At $300 a pop, we would be putting $9,000 in the hands of criminals, right? So we didn't want to do that. So for the first 50 calls, we pretty much just went all the way to them explaining how much money they want, and then we would find some, you know, reason to hang up, or we would just hang up, right? What we did in the end, we added another 10 calls where we did pretty much in the same thing, uh, you know, for the, for the largest part. But then for the last part, when they asked for money, we said, we don't believe you, right? We don't think that you showed us that we have a, you know, a problem, right? And my student did that, so I know this sort of experience, I have this second hand, right? But what he, what he told me is that um, some would sort of stay polite and they would try to tell you that, no, we're a legitimate company, look at our website, right, sure. Um, uh, others would turn a little bit rude, right? And one of them actually set a password on the Windows, right, before trying to reboot it, right? So he was trying to lock us out of our sort of system, right? Of course, it's a VM, so we don't care, right? Um, <laughs> but that's sort of, you know, what we do know, because I interacted with 20 of those you know, in the first sort of, uh, you know, set of, of 50 calls, that people are very polite, right? At least as far as the, you know, in order to convince you to pay money, right? They take their time, they explain, they don't take things for granted. Like, they don't tell you, click on your Windows key. They would say, do you see the key that looks like it has a flag on it, right? Um, or, you know, find the space that is located in the middle of your keyboard, right? So, like, if you don't know what the space is, these guys will tell you, right? And then when, you, when, they, when they connect to your machine using these remote administration tools, you have to accept a lot of warnings before, you know, you actually give them full permissions, right? So they're very polite, and they have things like they said, like, click on all the positive things, right? I thought that's such a succinct way of telling you, okay, yes, I agree, right? And so they would just tell you this one thing, and you could work yourself, right, through giving them essentially full access to your machine. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so you said you captured like videos of what they did on the VM and also like network yes. traces. Did, yeah. did they do anything interesting or did they just click on random things to make it look like they were doing something? They were following, um, so we, we uh, if I remember the numbers correctly, we identified like 13 different techniques of convincing you of malware. Uh, anything from opening up event viewer and showing previous warnings that are just benign and telling you that you see these 21 warnings, you have 21 viruses, right? Um, all the way to actually clearly making things up, right? So one of my favorite ones was that they can open your command line, and they will essentially run a command that creates a lot of output, like tree. So while it's printing, they tell you that this is a scanner that searches for problems, okay? <laughs> while it's printing, what these guys are doing is that they're actually pasting text, right, in that running command, uh, in the running command window, that will only appear after that command has run, right? So you see this program running for, let's say, 10 seconds, and at the end, it says, System at risk, enter. Virus found, right? This is stuff that they typed, right? But, you know, if you don't know any better, your own machine with the software that's already there tells you that, you're, that you have a problem, right? Yeah. Yes. So I have a uh, pedantic question, and I apologize in advance, but I'm actually really interested in the answer. You said that the uh, study was IRB approved. So you engaged in deception, right? When you're talking to those humans that we have to protect, even though they're absolute scammers, uh, we have to protect them. And typically when you do that, you're not gonna get a consent form, right? You're not gonna ask them, please sign this yes. to participate in this Stony Brook yes. experiment. <laughs> so typically what the IRB tells you, and I don't know if it's a law or if it's just common practice, is that you have to debrief them at the end. Right, we requested to be exempt. Um, so, okay, so I'm curious to see how you did this because um, I mean, I can take this yeah. offline, but I've uh, been trying to convince people to yeah. run this kind of experiments, and so I, I had a first a lot of painful interaction with you. It, this was my first IRB, right? And uh, <laughs> so the first time I got not rejected, but they pretty much just returned the thing with a lot of comments, and I had this very painful interaction, right, afterwards, because I had to convince about things that were just obvious to me, right? Like, how do you know you're not interacting with children? 
I'm calling a phone number, right? I don't know who will pick up the phone once this thing rings, right? So I had to come up with ways of saying, you know, like, the, we find these scams via malicious ads, right? And these places, these web pages are hosted on servers, right? In the US, you cannot enter a contract if you're not an adult, right? Therefore, if I'm finding this phone number through this means, I am calling someone who will likely be an adult, right? And we had this other person sitting there that if the person sounds like a child, we would hang up, right? Um, and we explained for both the, for the consent and for the debriefing that essentially this would bias our findings, right? Because these people are working in groups, I'm sure that they're exchanging information. So if I tell the first scammer, you know, by the way, you just participated in a study, right? The N minus one after that will <laughs> yeah. be painted. Right? Um, so, so, so I'm glad that you have a reasonable IRB is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it's not always the case. <laughs> Yes. Uh, for your VMs, did you infect any of them with actual virus or malware? No, no, we didn't do that. Uh, again, anecdotally, uh, these were uh, so these were just virtual boxes, um, and we had installed uh, in them the you know the guest tools. So you would get this this uh, icon in your tray, right, from these guest tools. What we typically try to do is we try to to just kill that process before we call them, so that they wouldn't see it, right? Um, sometimes I actually forgot, right. Uh, and other times they would just go to the control panel of you know installed programs and they would see right virtual box there right so in retrospect I shouldn't have installed the guest tools right um, what I found is that these people aren't very knowledgeable right so if you're willing to play along it's like oh I don't know what this is maybe my son installed it could this be it right uh, they are very much willing to sort of to take that right and work with it the other question is, um like what law enforcement agencies can actually do anything? Uh, uh, will these scammers ever get caught or punished? I don't know if this is a question for you, Laurie. Uh, <laughs> um, we just provide the means, right? We, we are providing leads to FTC and whoever wants. The FBI has also reached out to us for a few of these. And we can tell you things that we know, like servers and numbers, right? Um, but as you saw, right, in order to interact with them, you actually have to set up an infrastructure where you're calling and recording. So that part we can't, unfortunately, do for them. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you.